Hey guys, welcome back. Hey Greg, how you doing? Pretty good. So, your uncle, he had taken you to see your cousin, Dominic Astori, who was in the Gambino crime family. He had a social club in New Utrecht, and he had told him that you were going to jail. Was there something that your cousin could prepare you for? Was there some way he could prepare you for that? Well, it was my first time going to jail. I think I was, uh, I was about eighteen. Uh, on a youthful offender probation violation. And my uncle was just concerned that, you know, I had never been in jail. So he went to talk to Dominic Astori, who was actually my mother's cousin and my uncle's wife's cousin. You know, my, my mother and my uncle's wife were sisters. So we went down to the club and he told Dominic the situation. And Dominic said uh, that he, he knew someone in the jail and I would be all right. And That was basically the end of the conversation. I didn't think much. I didn't, you know, I, I knew that Dominic was a wise guy. I didn't really know his, you know, exactly what he was into and stuff at the time I was young. But anyway, I start my 60 day sentence in Nassau County Jail and they put you in a reception type area known as B floor. And the inmates are generally held there for 72 hours until they're cleared by medical. So it's like a 23 hour lock in. You get an hour to take a shower, make phone calls, go back in your cell. They feed you the food while you're in the cell, three meals a day. So the first day I get my hour out and I head back to my cell and the cell door closes. I'm just laying on my bunk saying to myself, boy, this really, you know, this really sucks. It's boring and, you know, it wasn't glamorous. And all of a sudden my cell door opens up a second time. And I had a strange feeling over me. I don't, you know, was wondering why they opened up my cell. And I, I believe it was a Sunday, too, so there was no visiting or anything. And all of a sudden, a guy walks over to me. He had a beard. Uh, he was about 5'9", uh, maybe maybe 165. His name was Anthony Scotto. And he says, come on, you're going to come out in the day room and, and you're going to work with us. You, you don't have to be locked in all day. So I says, wow, thanks. And he said, don't thank me. Thank that guy over there. He's one of the nicest murderers you will ever meet. He pointed to uh, an inmate named Peter Legata, Pete Legata, a convicted hijacker and contract killer who was awaiting a trial uh, for murder that he eventually got acquitted of. Anthony Scotto then added, and thank your uncle, who was actually you know my mother's cousin. I start working on the food cart with Pete. Anthony Scotto and another guy, Kevin Ferrin, who was a pro light heavyweight fighter who turned bank robber and was serving time. So that night, the food cart comes up and we begin serving the inmates. When we finished, I made myself a plate of some slop, ravioli, meat ravioli, whatever it was. And Anthony Scotto said, Hey, don't eat that shit. It'll kill you. He then reaches behind the food cart and he takes out these styrofoam closed trays, probably from a diner. with hamburgers and fries and whatever, coleslaw, whatever. And he gave me one. So Anthony Scotto had a lot of pull in Nassau County Jail. I haven't seen anybody with that much pull. And uh, so I, I ended up, you know, staying in his day room with these guys. They had their own TV. I was on, I was on the juvenile side. On the other side of me were Pete and Kevin and the adult side. And Anthony Scotto... had a cozy place in the jail in the medical ward. It was a big open section, just one locked door. You know, they had reclining beds and they had a TV in there, but Anthony Scotto had his own TV right by his cell. Uh, so at nighttime, Anthony Scotto would tell the guards that I was his nephew and he would call me into, you know, the area where we, he was at in the medical ward. And we'd play 500 Rummy, we'd play Scrabble, you know, different stuff like that. And he was just a really nice guy. He was very upbeat. He was always laughing. And so I was there. I was there with him for about two months. Anthony Scotto was the president of the Longshore. Well, he was the vice president, I think, of the Longshoreman Union. He got indicted and convicted of racketeering. He got five years. And he came down from Danbury, Connecticut, uh, to Nassau County Jail for, I guess, some legal matter. And that's when I met him, him and Pete. And just to add one, one other thing about Pete Legata. He was one of the most brutal inmates that anybody would ever see. One day while I was there, an inmate had uh, stole some something out of his cell. And he went on a tear with Kevin. And they Kevin was a 
light heavyweight profile. They basically beat up like eight guys. And Pete broke one guy's jaw, then broke his leg. He was really, really a, a, a brutal guy. So that, that was my story in, in Nassau County Jail. Now, around this time, you're meeting all these mobsters. Was this around the time when you met Barry Levin? I had met Barry Levin in 1978. I was in Herrick's High School, and I went out with his sister, Stacy, for a short time. And she had told me, um, hey, I want you to meet my brother, Barry. You know, he's a boxer. But I did meet Barry Levin. He lived in North Shore Towers, and he was a big guy, like 6'2", 6'3", 220. He had uh, 16 amateur fights upstate. Floyd Patterson had trained him. He was 15 and 1. He was really an excellent, excellent boxer. He was really fast. He he looked like a legitimate heavyweight. He had a lot of anger in him. He was pretty good, but for whatever reason, he decided to go to New Paltz College, and he went on to become a criminal defense attorney based in Nassau County. Today, I'm not friends with him. I'm not really the biggest fan of him. I'll tell you why. In 1990, when I got arrested, it was apparent that lawyers weren't trying to help me. I was getting railroaded. And Barry's cousins, the Zaxons, they were criminals too. Uh, Steve Zaxon and Brad Zaxon and their father was a loan shark. They said, come on, we're going to get you Barry. And Barry was starting to be, he was a lawyer for like four or five years at the time. And he had an office on Old Country Road. He was a Nassau County-based attorney. And we went to his office to to meet with him and retain him. And we had money, you know, and his cousins and his uncle would have backed me if I needed more money. He wasn't that high priced at the time. And we were going to pay him. And Barry didn't show up. And we, we waited there with his partner, Neil Gerst. And we waited about an hour and nobody knew where Barry was. He didn't show up. Somewhere down the line, another meeting is made to meet with Barry Levin in his house. Uh, I believe it was in Lido Beach by Long Beach. And we went there. His wife was there. Didn't even know we were coming. Everybody tried to get a hold of Barry, call in the office, what have you. He didn't show up. This happened like three or four times. A lot of people say he's a good criminal defense attorney. He's a mob attorney. Barry does a lot of white collar uh, crimes and what have you. And he was a Nassau County lawyer. He was in the loop. There was a lot of dirty stuff going on there. And Barry didn't want to help be the guy to help me and, you know, win the case when they were trying to convict me. And I have a lot of animosity towards him for doing that, man, because, you know, I, I really paid a heavy price. He could have said something, you know, Greg, call this lawyer in Queens or call this lawyer. You know, Barry did work in Queens before coming to Nassau. So I, I was really mad about that. And I, I don't think he's that great of a lawyer. He, he could be a good lawyer, but all lawyers, they work for the government first and they work for their client second. Uh, matter of fact, Barry has been fired a lot of times. Pat Romanello had used him, paid him a ton of money. And I had talked to his wife and they were really disgusted with Barry. Barry wanted Pat to plead guilty to 20 years, told him that was the best deal he can get. There was a lot of people, you know, witnesses that were lying. And, you know, these people don't sing. They compose stories together. And he fired Barry, got another lawyer, and he ended up getting 10 years. So Barry was wrong about that. Barry's cousin, he represented his cousin on, on a major weed case. He fired him. His uncle fired him. Vinny Gorgeous, what I could assure you, was not happy with Barry Levin either. During his trial, Barry made a misstep by telling the jury that, yeah, Vinny Gorgeous, he, he, he's a high-ranking member of the Bonanno crime family. So what? It doesn't mean he committed a crime. And I, I think he did that on purpose. So I uh, put it this way, I, I wouldn't recommend him, you know. Let's fast forward a little bit. 1987, Staten Island. You meet Gus Sirachi. How'd that happen? I met him a little later, like 89, I believe. Around 87, I met his cousin, Dominic Faraci, and Gus was in Arthur Kill Prison. I was very good friends with Dominic. I, I really liked him. Dominic ended up being on a case with Gus Faraci, and I guess they, they got him first. And he gave information or became an informant. A lot of people can't believe that he had flipped. Some people think that the government maybe gave him truth serum or something or whatever. I, I was shocked, but it was a you know very serious case, and they were facing a lot of time. So anyway, Gus, in 87, Gus was like basically finishing up his um, 
prison sentence. He had a, a like a manslaughter charge. He killed somebody in Manhattan, a, a gay guy or something who tried to come on him. Gus, he made a lot of fr- he made a lot of friends in Arthur Kill Prison. There was Jerry Chili there. Uh, he befriended Pete Legata. He befriended a, a, a biker named Rebel and a bunch of other guys. They're all hoodlums. And Gus didn't know that Rebel, the biker, and Pete Legata were longtime confidential informants, FBI informants, whatever they were. They were informants. Pete had got, Pete had got off on, uh, pretty easy a lot of times on charges. Pete was there. He had a murder, a second murder that he was arrested for. And he, he plea bargained it down to two to four years uh, with his record for hijacking and stuff like that. Being a known contract killer and ties to the mob, it's kind of impossible to get a two to four. So, But anyway, Gus befriended these guys and Pete Lugata had a partner on the outside, Steve Zaxon. They were major marijuana suppliers. And Lugata, before he was in jail and then after he got out, I guess, 88, he would tra- he would go down to Texas and he would transport back like two three thousand pounds of marijuana from Texas. He would take his whole family there in a big like truck or what have you and just fill it up with weed and come back uh, a trailer home. Legata became Gus Farachi's supplier and a lot of other people's suppliers. Uh, you couldn't beat his prices. He was going to Texas. The only place to get it cheaper was Mexico and. It's very dangerous to go there. They'll probably uh, fly your body back and take your money. So anyway, before Gus was released from Arthur Kill, he hooks up with Rebel, uh, his so-called friend, another inmate. And Rebel tells him that he has someone on the outside who will purchase large amounts of cocaine. And the friend, of course, was a DEA agent. Nevertheless, Gus proceeds to meet Rebel friend on the outside and makes a sale of two ounces of cocaine, at, at which time... Pete Legata tips off Gus that he's dealing with, you know, the DEA law enforcement. So Gus meets again with the DEA agent, Everett Hatcher, and this time shooting him three times in the head. Now there's a manhunt for Gus Farachi, and Pete Legata was out on a, on a weed case. Him and Saxon, Steve Saxon, they went to a, a, a so-called friend of theirs house who was also an informant. There was all informants around these guys. And they drop off 200 pounds of weed and they tell the guy to hold it. Uh, when they come back for the weed, the guy tips off the FBI. And uh, when they drive away with the marijuana, they just happen to get pulled over. Uh, so they got, you know, fingered by the guy they left it at their house. Uh, so he had a case pending. And to get off that case, he was given as much information about Gus Farachi as he can, as far as people he knew in jail people who might have been helping him, people who might have been giving him money. And, uh, you know, Gus Farachi w- was the suspect of, you know, the murdering Agent Hatcher. So after all this, who kills him? I'm not sure who killed Gus Farachi. I'm, I'm just, you know, basically telling this story or, or you know, on my memory and what I what I knew, you know. I, I heard a couple of names came up. I don't think anybody was a- arrested for the murder for him. But... A lot of people from prison were hiding Gus out because the mob wasn't going to hide him out. They had too much pressure on them, and they weren't going to make any money. The FBI was everywhere. People were getting – that knew Gus um, were getting violated on parole, whether they knew where he was, whether they, they didn't want to cooperate or what have you. Uh, they were going back to prison, and they violated everybody's – Parole. Matter of fact, a, a friend of mine, Handsome Jack's brother, Dominic Giordano, he was on parole and they asked him about, you know, Gus. He would never say anything anyway, but he didn't even know anything about where he was and they violated his parole. Then finally, um, a guy from prison, John Petroselli, I didn't know him, but I knew his son really well. His son ended up uh, killing somebody too. He might even still be in jail. He was hiding out Gus and the mob went to him and they said, you know, you have to give Gus up, and he wouldn't give Gus up, and he ended up getting killed. I think it was on video. I, I think they had the the guy who killed him on video, actually on video, like shooting him. So it, it, it caused a lot of problems for a lot of people. And then and one other thing just to add, too, you know, um, back at that time, work release, I think Governor Como was in office, and he believe me, he was a, a, a good crook and hooting him himself. They had a, a lawyer. And he worked in parole at one time. I think he might have been a probation officer and he 
turned a lawyer. And what he would do was, if you wanted to try to get, if you were turned down for work release, you went to him and you gave him uh, $2,500, $3,000. And, and, and a week later, you were on work release, whether you had a violent crime or what have you. So everybody, you know, marbled from the street. They all went to this guy. What happened was how it came to an end was when Gus Farachi killed the DEA agent, he was actually on work release. He had a big boat and, and he named the boat work release, matter of fact. And I think the agent said something like, you know, how did this guy get work release or whatever? And they they all, um, you know, they followed the line or whatever, the lawyer that that he had and this and that. And, um, so that was a way of getting out on work release at one time, paying your way in there through this lawyer. But that all came to an end. The, the lawyer then afterwards couldn't get anybody in work release. So for some reason, two Lucchese family soldiers, well, one soldier, James Gaglioni and Mario Gallo, for some reason in 1997, they admit to murdering Faraci, part of a plea deal. Is that a genuine thing or is that something just to help reduce their sentence in a plea agreement? Does that sound fishy? I didn't know those guys. I don't know. Uh, who the shooters were or anything like that. They might have been arrested and, you know, they might have even been innocent and there just might have been some, uh, a lot of evidence against them. They took a plea bargain or whatever. Or maybe they did kill him. You know, there's a lot of informants out there. You know, whatever you're doing on the street, the government seems to know. 